Hi, Matt here, really quick, just asking for a request from all you listeners out there. Uh, I mention it later on in the podcast, but please, if you are listening, just hit pause. Give us a quick rating on Apple Podcasts if you can. Uh, and give us a five-star review, please, if appropriate, help us out a little bit. We want to get our ratings and our reviews up there, so please, if you can, just do a quick pause. Go ahead and submit that review and rating, and then come back and uh, keep on listening. So, thanks in advance. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Kmart, where you can buy all the underwear you want. We've got a special uh, spokesperson here with me today, uh, Raymond Babbitt. Uh, Raymond, do you buy your underwear at Kmart? You have to go to Kmart, 400 Oak Street. Raymond, that's that's not that's not the line. Say what's what what say what's in front of you. What 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 line do you have there? I my boxer shorts at Kmart. Perfect. There you go. So uh, shop at Kmart where you can get anything your heart desires, including your underwear. Isn't that right, Raymond? Kmart sucks. Oh, okay. This. This spot's over. This is over. Lights, camera, action. And the winner is. Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast, episode 16. Gazoon tight, Toby. <laughs> Just sneezing right at the beginning of the, for the recording. He's so bad at the beginning. Why just at the beginning? He like waits for us to settle down and then he settles down or what? I don't, I, oh I don't know. Oh my god. Crazy, crazy dog. Crazy Apologies dog. if that blew out your speakers, your headphones. But we love him. <laughs> we tell ourselves that at least. So Yeah, poor thing tore, partially tore a ligament in his knee earlier this yeah, week. Yeah, that's so. why. So yeah, this is episode 16, a little bit of a delay partially, uh, no pun intended because of uh, our dog's partially torn ligament. Uh, It happened the night that we usually record, so we were at the emergency vet and everything. So trying to get an episode out before the Oscars uh, so we can kind of put a close on 2019 before going into our our next episode. So, yeah, that's what we're trying to do here. So we're going to, you know, dive into the usual suspects when it comes to the segments of you know what we've been watching or reading or whatever the trailer park a couple super bowl trailers here for everyone and then uh our current movie review uh we couldn't really decide on for a little while we decided to go with the two popes as the last of the kind of oscar contending movies that we'll review uh from 2019 and then our best picture winner is from 1988 which is rain man uh, and then, in fashion, to close out 2019, we'll go through our top 10 uh, rankings or movies of 2019, uh, most of which we probably reviewed on the podcast, but maybe not all of them, so who knows what, we, what we'll have there. So that's what we got on store or in store for you today, so let's dive into what we've been watching, reading, or whatever. Did you? Who wanted to go first? I can start. Okay, go for it. Um, I started watching a new show last night. I'll see if I want to get you into this or not. You probably won't be interested, but <laughs> Netflix uh, released one of their own like original reality shows called The Circle. Oh God! At the I've, beginning of the year, I've heard of this. And so yeah, it's like it's eight contestants, and they each have their own little apartment, whatever. They're isolated from everyone. Their only way to interact with each other is through a social media platform called The Circle. Which doesn't immediately sound like that fascinating, but they they cast really great people. I laughed out loud so many times watching the first episode, so I think there's some really interesting people. So while you are gone this weekend, I will be watching The Circle. <laughs> Side note, you have quote-unquote terrible taste in reality TV. No, I don't! Okay. I do not! Okay, that's fair, because you did decide to stop watching The what? Bachelor. I was going to say, what are my favorite reality shows? Survivor, which you watched with me. Below 
deck. <laughs> Blow deck med, yeah, I know, whatever. It's usually the shows your aunt is recommending to you are the <laughs> ones where I kind of roll my eyes a little bit. I watch Top Chef, which you also watch with me. Those are my two favorite reality shows, so don't go tell me i got bad taste in reality TV. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if HGTV counts as reality TV. Probably not. I, <laughs> but, I do count. Those. Well, of course... You know, technically speaking, TV falls into scripted and unscripted, and shows on HGTV, HGTV are scripted, so there you go. But anyway, so as well watch, I guess I will not invite you to watch it with me. Yeah, I'll just I'll, watch it and enjoy I've it I've heard myself. about that show. It, I'm, I'm good. It's another, like, social media. I, I, I've heard about it a little bit, but it, it, it didn't, like, catch my attention too much. It's The thing that's been funny to me is that there are some people who are being 100% truthful in their profiles that they're interacting with, but some of them are are catfishing them. So, like, there's this one guy, he's like, my girlfriend gave me all of her photos and I'm pretending to be her. <laughs> and so people are like, ooh, Rebecca, she's so cute. Girl power. And he's like, yeah, this is weird. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's fascinating. Oh, that was it. Sorry. I was <clears throat> I remembering a TV show that you watch, and I mentioned it in a group chat with some friends and yeah, so it was the Kristen Cavallari show. Very Cavallari. Yeah, you watched that one too. I I watched the first season. Okay, because I brought that up when Jay I, Cutler, I watch it for Jay Cutler. I was saying because Jay, Jay Cutler is like huge in that, and I brought it up because he did an interview with a podcast that I listened to, and I was telling friends about it, and um, one of the one of my friends uh, <laughs> replied back and was. For so, this is a quote from him. Said, "For some reason, that cracks me up that Haley watches <laughs> Kirsten Cavallari." <laughs> so. I don't watch it for her. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Anyway, so okay, so that you you Long, were watching that the circle. Yes, okay, the moving circle. on. Yep, moving on. Exactly. What else? What else did you have? Uh, we finally watched uh the live action Aladdin last week and the like remake of The Lion King. Yep, we did. Uh, which the I don't think either of those is gonna pop up on my ratings later on. Maybe they will for you, but I'll I'll hold off some opinions on those movies for when we do our twenty nineteen rankings because they'll at least pop up as an honorable mention or something. So, but yeah, we did watch both of those. They're both on Disney Plus now. We kind of waited until they show up there, so we didn't have to go outside to watch them. We can just watch them in our own house. <laughs> yep. So. Yep. Yeah, yeah th those are fun to watch, so. Nice. And I read a mini comic book series called Cold Spots, which was really good. Uh, it was just a five-issue thing uh, that was kind of a, about a, a dad who is hired. He's a private investigator. He's hired to find his missing daughter and ex-wife, but mother of his child. <clears throat> and it brings him into this supernatural world. Where there's a bunch of ghosts around, and whenever a ghost is around, it be becomes really cold. So it's like the middle of the summer, and they're on an island where it should be in the 80s or whatever, but everything's frozen. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of too short for me. I wish it would have been a little bit longer, because I was really getting into it, and the next thing I knew it was over. So it kind of, it, to me, it came to an abrupt end. I wish it would have been like... A 12, you know, like a year-long run, like a 12-issue mini, kind of like Royal, Royal City, mm -hmm. that one, which we, we both read and, yep, and enjoyed. Was that was 12 issues, so I felt like you could kind of dive into some of the story a little bit more, uh, but still pretty good. I watched, also on <clears throat> Disney+, Plus. I watched Willow, which I hadn't seen in forever, directed by Ron Howard and created, written by George Lucas. About a little, it's a fan fantasy world about a little guy uh, uh, who is like a sorcerer of some kind, or he wants to be, and it's this whole adventure story where he's trying to save a baby to save the world. Um, but really enjoyed it. Really schlocky, over the top action <laughs> and craziness that happens, but you know the kind that you like. It isn't like in a bad way. It's a, it's in all the best ways possible. Really schlocky. Uh, we watched Almost Famous recently, yeah. which I'll hold off uh, too much opinion on it because I think that might be a movie that we'll review in the near future. Possibly, maybe not, but uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I liked that movie. I hadn't seen it in a while. 
Yeah, and it has, like, I, I love, like, early 2000s Kate Hudson. That's when she also did How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, and I just... She's so pretty, and she's so cute, and I really like mm-hmm. her character in that it, movie. So, it's her it was only, good. only Oscar nomination for Almost Famous, and she won the Golden Globe for it, too, so a lot of people say she maybe could have or should have won the Oscar, uh, but, yeah, really good. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to, I actually forgot to bring it up, uh, during last week's episode, but I went and saw Pain and Glory, that Antonio, oh, that's ba- right. Antonio Banderas movie that he's nominated for this year, uh, it's from Spain, you know, so it's subtitled in Spanish. I went and saw that to kind of round out, uh, the Best Actor nominees, because I was so judgmental on Adam Sandler should have been nominated or Robert De Niro or something right. but I hadn't even seen Pain and Glory so I wanted to go see it uh, it was pretty good I still think there's some people that could have gotten a nomination over Antonio Banderas but I am happy that he's nominated because he's one of those actors that's been around for a while is really good I like him a lot so it's nice to see him get his first nomination but yeah that's what I've got for what I've been watching reading and whatever so yeah, and the only other thing was uh, we watched the Super Bowl last weekend. Oh which yeah, was fun. of course. I was say I was I was rooting for Kansas City, so I I thought it was a really uh, a really fun game. It was really entertaining and uh, kind of made it close at the end. So yeah, uh, the score it was a lot closer than the score says, right? Yeah. I think the final was thirty one to twenty. Yeah. So you kind of look at that go at eleven point difference, but yeah, those, there, there was a garbage time touchdown. Yeah, I'd say there was like three touchdowns scored in a six minute span. I yeah. mean. In the fourth quarter, I think the Chiefs were down ten. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, so I yeah I thought it was a really fun, really entertaining game. So um, yeah, good for the Chiefs. I was happy for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we want to get into the trailer park this week. Uh, so we'll bring up a few trailers that actually aired during the Super Bowl. The first is uh, Marvel did a TV spot for all of their TV shows that are coming up to Disney Plus pretty soon. And so that included WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and then Loki. I think that was all of them. Yep. So yeah, we got a couple clips of each one. Really, only one for Loki that I can think of. The last scene where he looks like he's in a prison outfit or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I got a couple clips of all three of them. Any... I mean, I'm a big Marvel nut, so I have my opinions on them. But what, what did you think of any of them after that trailer? To be honest, I I don't need any more Marvel in my life. Like after after Endgame, I was like, okay, yep, that was you good. Mean after that was Spider-Man. <laughs> okay. Spider-Man came um, out after that. You know, it's like I just I really feel like it's gonna be overdone. I mean, I think people will watch it, but it's not something that I need to spend. And honestly, the clips from WandaVision, I don't even understand what that show is supposed to be. Those are, like, my two least favorite characters, so to see the two of them together, like, on their own thing, I'm like, no, I don't think so. So that's the one, I mean, uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier, I think, is going to be really good. I would think that one would probably be the best. I would hope it'd be the best. I think that one's the safest bet for being good. You kind of know what you're going to get with it. I think it's going to be similar to, like, the the second Captain America movie, Winter Soldier. Yeah. It's like, you know espionage ish or uh you know kind of that that the spy angle or that kind of action sequence it's kind of cool getting to see sam practice the the shield throw (laughs) yeah because he you need to practice that it's not anything you know anyone can do i mean john favreau at the end of the last spider-man movie tries pulling it off and he can't do it so glad to see sam is practicing it uh but yeah that one that one i'm sure will be good It'll probably be the most straightforward, like, you know what you'll be getting with it. Loki, I don't really know what it's going to be about. Uh, the news came out that Owen Wilson has been cast in that show, in Loki. Huh. Has uh, he ever done TV before? I am not sure. I can't recall anything he's done, but that doesn't mean he hasn't, so. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not, not 100%. I can try to look some things up, but uh, in the meantime, uh, there's rumors on who he might play it hasn't been confirmed one way or another okay are you well adverse enough in marvel knowledge to no. have a guess at who he might no, play probably not <laughs> okay because one of the rumors that i had heard or read going around was maybe he'd play like an alternate reality thor <laughs> which is 
I think maybe it's just because he has blonde hair. People are thinking. I was gonna say that was the only thing I would have come up with was in like uh, some sort of different Thor. <laughs> yeah, because it is. Uh, this is supposed to. Both Loki and WandaVision, I think, are supposed to tie into um, Doctor Strange, which is titled, the you know, uh, the multiverse is in the title of that movie. So maybe a multiverse thing could be tied in, because this Loki is a different Loki than the one that died in Endgame. It's the one that escaped with the Tesseract. So it is a different Loki, so who knows, you know, if the, we'll run into a bunch of other characters in their alternate version of them or something but WandaVision mm -hmm. like you said you don't know what's going on with that one because uh, like every time they show them it looked like oh they're in a scene from Dick Van Dyke where it's like black and white or it's like she's pregnant in the Brady Bunch house and I'm just like what like what is this supposed to be so and that's the point I think so they've described it's half of it as a sitcom show and the other half is like a horror show Ooh, okay. so what I think it is, is Wanda, so Vision is dead, right? Like, he, he died in Infinity War, and he didn't come back in Endgame. Spoiler alert. It's been out for <laughs> almost a year. It's fine. I know. I'm giving people a warning. <laughs> After I <laughs> yep. said it? Okay, yep. perfect. You didn't give me the chance. <laughs> um, so I think the TV sitcom versions are her creating that reality with her powers because she can't deal with what a vision being dead so she's creating this family life with him mm -hmm. in these different tv show formats that maybe she watched as a kid growing up in sokovia or, or something like that hmm. okay uh, and then the second half is supposed to be horror so that's going to be more she gets snapped out of that fake reality and is dealing with it and maybe her powers are driving her mad or or she's just using them to dive into a uh, multiverse, and that's what ties into the Doctor Strange sequel, because that's been described as a horror movie as well, and I think she's supposed to be in it. So, you know, I think it'll be taking that angle. So I, that's the one that I think is the most intriguing to me, because it's the most out there. It's the, it's the crazier story, right? Like, Falcon and Winter Soldier is going to be similar to Captain... America and the Winter Soldier, presumably, and Loki is, you know, for the most part, we kind of have an idea on what that'll be, but WandaVision is the one that's kind of out there, and it'll either be really good or really bad, I think. Yep. Um, the next trailer we've got is The Jesus Rolls. Yeah, so this is one, I'm not sure if people are, uh, really care about this. So you've seen parts of The Big Lebowski. Do mm -hmm. you care that this is a somewhat sequel to a minor character from The Big Lebowski? No. Yeah, I, I don't really, it was written and directed by John Turturro, so that's kind of cool yeah. that he's doing that himself. Uh, and it's got some big-ish name, you know, A-list stars or actors in this. You got Susan Sarandon, John Hamm, and then... Pete Davidson, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, who was, uh, is it like John Cannavale? Is that his oh, name Bobby. too? Oh, Bobby. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Cannavale is in this too. So yeah, yeah he's another bit. He was in The Irishman. He's been yep. in Jumanji yep. and all that stuff. So he's good too. But this is one, I, I don't really care. Like, the Jesus was a small character in The Big Lebowski, which is a movie I love, but... He, he's got like one or two scenes and he's really funny in them. It isn't really a character I need a whole movie around. Uh, the trailer, there's kind of some funny parts in it, but it just isn't a character that I needed a whole movie dedicated to. Sure. So. I mean, I will admit though, like it looks highly entertaining. Like I don't care that it's, you know, a spinoff more or less of the Big Lebowski, like a character from the Big Lebowski, but I thought it looked really entertaining. Yeah, because he's like, a convicted felon. And then he escapes from prison and is kind of on the run is the feeling I got from the trailer. So, yeah, I mean, I guess if you just look at it as a movie yeah, uh, by stand itself. Yeah, standalone kind of thing. I mean, yeah, then who knows? Maybe maybe it'll be good. Um, I just, it isn't when I saw what it was or and watched the trailer, it isn't a movie I went, I'm really excited to yeah. see this. I mean, it's, it's probably like a middle of the road kind of yeah. thing. So, yep. Uh, so yeah, that's probably all we need to say about yeah. that one. Um, and then we discussed the teaser for this one last week, but the full trailer dropped for the next Fast and Furious movie, F9. Um, so yeah, again, Vin Diesel's in this, Michelle Rodriguez, John Cena, Ludacris, Tyrese. Seems like the whole gang's back. So uh, yeah, what would you think of the full-length trailer? Yeah, so I got here the definition of F9. It's uh, to refresh a document in... Microsoft Word. 
Uh, it'll send and receive email in Microsoft Outlook. And uh, it opens a mission control to an Apple computer. That's F9. Oh, huh. there you go. F9. Yep, F9. <laughs> I don't know. This movie, it was funny watching this trailer with you. Because how many times did you laugh? Like, during well, this trailer? <laughs> Because it's I mean, just because these movies are all about over the top ridiculousness that happens, but well, you, here's you what it was. Like, laugh twice. I think. Well, one the trailer was like three minutes long. It was yeah, it was long, so longer long. than usual. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, maybe 20, 30 seconds in, um, Letty's like, I don't even remember John Cena's character's name. Jacob. Yeah, but he's ch- he's kind of chasing them, yeah. or yeah. Yeah, she's like, Jacob is Dom's brother. And I literally laughed nonstop for like the next twenty seconds because of how freaking ridiculous that is. It's so dumb. This, this man is all about family. <laughs> so, family. Oh, family. Just, like, but oh, there's a brother what? that I don't have. That, oh my do you God. think he's actually his biological brother, or Probably is it not. another metaphorical brother? I don't know. I don't know. But I just I, do you care? No, I don't. I don't care at all. I don't. I sound really. Midwestern was that? No, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. Eh? Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it was just. It looks stupid. It was it just. just looks stupid. It was just ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, it like because me and and Dom. I mean, they've been in every almost every single movie. They were in the first one. They were going to be in this one. Just never bringing up a, a brother, another yeah. brother. Yeah. In over twenty years of this <laughs> franchise or whatever, it's just. And they they played him off. Uh, John Cena's character is this guy who's trying to, like, overtop or, or be better than his brother. You know, yep. he's like that whole th- mentality of like I'm going to be better than you. So he's this hitman assassin who is who can drive a car better than anyone. So it's I bet you back during Fast and Furious one, uh, he's probably loving life because Dom was just a guy who stole DVD players. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob's like that bar is pretty low. I don't have to be uh, that much better. Don't have better. to do anything. But yeah. every single Fast and Furious movie, Dom's gotten better and better. So uh, Jacob's had to go through some shit. I'm sure to keep up with Dom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the other part. You remember the other part you laughed at? It's at the I, end of the trailer. I don't even. It was. <laughs> it was. So they're chasing Jacob. They're in cars. Oh, oh my and gosh. Jacob, yes, no, I remember. Jacob, okay, well, I'll just get through a little bit here. Jacob drives his car off a cliff, and it's like, what? And then Charlize Theron's back in this as a villain who's in cahoots with Jacob. She flies in with a magnet plane. <laughs> a and magnet just, plane. And just, boop, picks picks Jacob up out of thin air. Picks the and then, car up. And then what do Dom and, Dom and Letty do? Because they they can't turn around at this point. They're going to fly off this cliff too. Would you remember what they do? No, I don't. So a bridge. Oh, is... <laughs> God, I can't. It's so bad. I say I don't remember. And then yeah, I'm like, I know you remember. I'm going to give myself like two seconds. That's what, usually my thing. What, what happens? You say what happens. <laughs> they, I don't remember exactly how they do it, but they basically like try to swing across yeah so the bridge is <laughs> like out but there's still like a post with the rope going across yeah. it so he just hits the nos goes right at the the post and it breaks it and while the car is flying over the cliff it gets stuck in the tire so it catches it and then they swing and then that's how the trailer ends uh which in the seventh <laughs> so movie i think is when they flew through a window out of a tower yes, and then landed out of in the building. That's when it, I went, oh, okay, this is starting to get, but that one's at least like whatever. Okay, that's over the top. This is just ridiculous. So I want a wanna, magnetic plane I w- that yep. can pick up a car in, in mid-air, midair. Yep. Yep. That's, and use a bridge. And you know what? That's not even the most ridiculous thing in this trailer. This across bridge thing. a canyon. So I got some. I want to play a quick game here with the, that whole swinging across the canyon thing. Because if when they make it and the car lands, like they're still attached to this. So Good point. What is the most ridiculous way that they could detach from this swing when they land? I came out with like Letty just throws a knife out the window <laughs> at the rope and cuts it just as they land. And say, how realistic does this need to be? This <laughs> this trailer has a magnetic plane in it. Doesn't have to be real. This <laughs> like, is the game of get the most ridiculous ever. Well, they'd probably like call in Daenerys on one of her dragons okay. to get like a little more realistic within the framework of the Fast hey, and Furious franchise. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
That would make sense. Hey, use your fire and just like cut through this bridge right. that we're attached to. Okay, so throw it across throw. the most uh uh what's the word I'm looking for? Crossover event. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like a, yeah, just a crossover. But like the event, yeah. I can't think of the word. That's right. Matter. Ambitious. The most ambitious crossover. <laughs> Fast and Furious in Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones? Okay. And that's... So then for F10, F11, F12, uh, it'll just, it'll reintroduce more and more Game of Thrones characters. And then yep. by the end of it, they're going to be stopping the, the White Walkers. Probably. Okay. All right. I'll buy into that. Um, <laughs> Don, Don becomes king or something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, last... <laughs> Last thing on this, because John Cena is basically taking over the Rock ish spot. Not necessarily. I'm not saying the Rock was playing his brother, but oh, let's get a really muscular like former wrestler, wrestler. or whatever. He's taking the Rock's spot. Uh, there are rumors that the Rock and um, Jason Statham, so Shobbs and Ha, yep, will show up in this movie. Hobbs and Shaw, you mean? Oh, what I say? Shobbs and Haw. <laughs> <laughs> Slob on that Haw. Um, they're going to show up in this movie as a surprise because they, The Rock has had a feud with this cast and that's kind of why they went and did that spinoff movie. Yep. But apparently they kind of, they made up a while ago, like over a year ago. So the rumor is that they might show up in this movie because Helen Mirren was in this trailer. Oh, yeah. That's right. That was another thing. I'm like, Helen Mirren, do you have nothing better to this, do? This isn't her first appearance in this oh franchise. She plays Shaw's mom. Oh, okay. So. Uh, eh, okay, it makes a little more sense. Yeah, so. But still. Uh, so the rumor is that, you know, she's in the trailer. Maybe they show that up in this. That would be a good one to throw in for Six Degrees. Fast and Furious? Oh, Helen Mirren. Yep. Yeah. He'll people, throw you on your head. Definitely. That's. One way to flip genres with someone, oh I guess. Oh my gosh. Okay, keep uh, going. So, rumors are they might be in this to set up the 10th movie, which rumor is they'll be going to space in the 10th one. Oh my god. Well, there's nowhere else to go with this it's franchise. True. So, might as well go to space. Hmm. So, that's, that's F9. F9, that's right. And then, yeah, last little bit of kind of news. Uh, in the trailer park, recently we talked about the movie Birds of Prey. So, apparently, our take on movie trailers it isn't always the best because we completely destroyed that movie. Yeah, I think I said it was going to be a hot pile of garbage. And it opened at Rotten Tomatoes at 92%. So, it was insane. Not um, what I would have expected. No. So, maybe we'll have to check that out. And I say that because I panned uh, the bad, bad Boys for Life movie like when i saw that trailer come out i didn't really destroy it i was more like yeah. this movie isn't gonna be great it's gonna be really entertaining like the second one but it's not gonna be great but apparently this one is just really good like characters and everything it isn't just explosions and, and entertainment like that it's actually mm -hmm. just a good movie so cool uh we'll actually have to check might have to check those out i the first reviews for movies uh comic book well movies in general but comic book movies too that the, the Studio will bring in people that they kind of think or know will like the movie to kind of get ratings really good to begin with or as good as they could be. And then uh -huh. it usually tails off after that. So we'll see with Birds of Prey. But still, I mean, when you open up at 92%, it's going to be really good. Oh, last, I'm sorry. Last, last thing with F9, Han is back. Yeah, that's right. Which, maybe it's Han. Maybe they just go with like a soap opera and it's his twin brother or something because <laughs> sure. the hashtag going around for this movie is hashtag justice for Han. Well, if he's still alive, I mean, I don't know what you need justice for, but uh, I always like that character. Uh, so I'm happy he's back, but at the same time, I'm very confused on how he's back because he just he got he straight up exploded and died. So I don't know how he's back, but. Yeah. I don't know. With this franchise, anything's possible. Maybe it was cloned or something. I don't know. Yeah, so, there you go. <laughs> there we go. That's all, I, that's all I got. We should move on. Then we can yep. talk about that forever. Sounds good. Okay, so moving on into the current buzz or current movie review we've got here. So Netflix movie came out in 2019. Uh, the Two Pulps. It was written by Anthony McCartan, directed by Fernando... Uh, how do I pronounce that? 
Marais, Marais, probably. Yeah, you're probably right. You're better at that than me. Directed by <laughs> Fernando Marais. Uh, stars Jonathan Price as uh, Pope Francis and Anthony Hopkins as Pope Benedict. So when this, I heard about this movie initially. Oh, by the way, this is just going to be spoilers because these are real people. It's kind of a yeah, real story. It's, it's about true events, so Fair, there's not really that, anything to spoil. That part's, yeah. I mean, it's about real people. We don't know if this actually happened because everything that happens with the Pope is behind closed yeah, doors. But, but the basic gist of it. Yeah. So anyways, true. when I saw this movie, heard, first heard about this movie, it's a movie about, you know, obviously the title, Two Popes. I had no interest in seeing this movie. I thought it was going to be very dry and boring. Like, oh, a movie about two popes. Like, how entertaining could this possibly be? Uh, I, I had a little hope when I saw who it was directed by. Because uh, the director, Fernando, he directed one of my all-time favorite movies. I even got uh, one of my better friends. He was a, uh, one of my roommates in college to watch the movie City of God. And it is now his favorite movie. Uh, he he directed that movie, and he also directed this. He, and the third one was uh, The Constant Gardener, which is from 2006. And Rachel Weisz won an Oscar for her role in that movie. I love that movie as well. So when I saw he directed this, I'm like, oh, all right, maybe... He's done some good stuff. Yeah, stuff that I love. So maybe <clears throat> this will be good. Uh, but then when I heard about more and more reviews and how it's actually an entertaining movie... And then the Oscar nominations it got with lead actor and supporting actor for Price and Hopkins, uh, respectfully. Um, I was, and it's on Netflix. It's easy to watch. All right, we might as well watch it. Mm-hmm. And I was surprised with how much I liked it and how entertaining it was. Uh, and then, while well, at the same time, I think it could have been better. Even there's some parts yeah. of it that yeah. uh, I think they could have either taken out or changed a little bit. So overall, I I enjoyed this movie i gave it uh an 8.3 out of 10 so yeah i enjoyed it a fair amount what did you think of the two popes yeah i i enjoyed it more than i thought i would and like you said when when i first heard about it i was like what could this possibly like this sounds really dry and boring uh watching the trailer made it seem a little more interesting especially as finding out it's kind of about the transition of Pope Benedict um, kind of like resigning and then the election of Pope Francis. I'm like, okay, that's that's kind of interesting. Like the trailer just had kind of a more fun vibe than I think I was expecting. So um, yeah, overall, I, I really enjoyed the movie. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It was funnier than I thought yeah. it was going to be. Like yeah. the, the banter, the quick one-liners from both of them mm-hmm. were pretty good. Even, um, you know, Anthony Hopkins as... Uh, Pope Benedict. I mean, he had a bunch of lines where he's just like, um, he's kind of taken some hits at, at Francis because the two of them don't really see eye to They're eye very on a lot different. of things. But very, then, very different. So, you know, he's saying things to him like, oh yeah, let's take a walk. We'll walk right over here. I'll introduce you to God. Yeah, come here. Over here. You know, <laughs> so he's got, there, it was funnier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, like the movie starts with, and uh, you know, someone who... Uh, I'm not Catholic, and I, I mean, I know some of the basics of Catholicism, but not a lot, and I certainly didn't know, um, like, what their, um, uh, like, what their given names were, and so the movie starts with Pope Francis, like, trying to book a flight, and he gets hung up on because people are like, they didn't believe that it was the Pope trying to schedule his own flight. (laughs) Yeah. So, like, that that was just kind of funny. Yeah. Well, it, and that was the one thing we had some confusion with in this movie is who is who. Because <laughs> yeah, we didn't true. know their real names. <laughs> they didn't. kept they kept calling them, uh, like, Jorge and... and uh, I knew Radzinger. I was pretty sure on Radzinger. But um, I didn't know Pope Francis's given, like, birth name. So, when they kept referencing his name, I wasn't 100% sure who they were talking about. So, I had to clear that up. But... You were saying with the beginning of the movie, I was really that was really cool seeing the conclave, like yep. how that works and the voting and everything. That was really cool. Yeah, so that was like the vote for like the new the new mm-hmm. pope because it and they tied in some um, like live like real footage. So like they had some of the footage from Pope John Paul's like funeral procession, and mm-hmm. so that you know of course kicked off the conclave. So yeah, technically, like, three popes in the this election. Movie. Oh, very true. Yes, three popes. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, that starts the, um, election, uh, that resulted in Pope Benedict. Mm-hmm. Cause, yeah, um, Pope 
Francis or Jorge, I guess. I know how do you say his last name? Ber- Bergoglio. Oh, Bergoglio. Yeah, that's it. He got second in the voting initially, uh, if I remember right. I think that's right. And it was something where he didn't even really want it, but people kept voting for him and wanted him to have it. And that's kind of the theme through the movie is usually the right choice is the one who doesn't necessarily want the responsibility uh, because Ratzinger like wanted it. He wanted to be Pope and, you know, ultimately it didn't really work out for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was something that, like I said, it was, it was fun seeing their interaction because they're very, very different. And, you know, again, this is like a dramatization of what really happened. So when I talk about this stuff, I'm talking only like based on what we saw in the movie, not necessarily what, you know, might have happened in, in real life, if any of this stuff is exaggerated. But, you know, Pope Benedict was, uh, he was very, like, formal with everything and very conservative, very traditional. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the first time that we see the two of them meet, he's at, like, the Pope's summer house or something. I'm like, oh, gosh, I didn't even know that was a thing. And, you know, just, like, how he has, he's kind of accepted all the like lavish things that have come from being a pope he's got his own uh house there and just like the clothes he wears and like the fancy red shoes and he doesn't eat with anyone in his estate and Mm -hmm. and you know he's not pope yet so jorge he's just like lighten up like talk to the people get to know he's just naturally really quote-unquote friendly and likes talking with people he was talking to the gardener about Oregano. The oregano that was growing in the yard and everything, and it, it was stuff that Pope Benedict didn't even really know about. So he was just, he's, the movie portrays him as just being able to connect with people a lot easier, um, which was, you know, really nice. I mean, the portrayals were great. Anthony Hopkins was great as, as Pope Benedict. And they so, both looked a lot like them, which yeah. was really, I think, well, that's, really helps That them. was the rumor that that's why uh, Jonathan Price got the job as Pope Francis, because Fernando, when he was Googling Pope uh, Francis, like, you know, to get real photos of him, Jonathan Price's picture kept <laughs> showing up uh, in Google search, and he was like, yeah, he does look exactly like him. I'm going to cast him in this movie. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's some so overall, really enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I didn't love, so there's a lot of flashback scenes that happen in this movie for Pope Francis, for Jorge earlier in his life, like how he got into the church and into being a, a priest and cardinal and just things that happened to him earlier in life. And I like I was fine with the first flashback because it shows him being, what was he, a scientist or chemist? Yep. yep. Something, one of, something mm-hmm. along those lines. Yeah, he's like working in a lab. Yeah, yeah, and he was religious but not obviously as, you know, deep into it as what he would later on be in, in life. And he was in love. Uh, and it kind of showed how he became, started becoming more and more religious, like what got him out of the, you know, being a scientist and, or chemist or whatever it was. I, I, I was fine with that flashback. I liked it. It gave yeah. a little bit of, you know, you learned a little bit more about him. But there are so many more flashbacks after that where I was just like, I don't really care. Because it, it, it showed why he didn't feel like he should be Pope. It was because he had made some mistakes as a priest, you know, uh, earlier in life. Mm -hmm. I just didn't care. I found myself kind of bored with those parts. You know, that's when I was kind of picking up my phone, checking other things. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It was whenever Anthony Hopkins, Jonathan Price were on screen together. That's when I was really engaged and I thought the movie was at its strongest. So I didn't... Uh, I would totally... I didn't really need some of those flashback scenes. Yeah, or at least, like, cut them down a little bit. I just... They went into such great detail and honestly I thought, I'm like, you could have had, like, a two-second conversation about this where he could have just said, yeah, I don't feel like I can do this role because of... My role during like the war back in Argentina. It's like, oh, yeah. okay, fine. Like that's that's it, yeah. all I really would have needed to know. Because it was, it was, you know, him and it was him and Anthony Hopkins, or him, the two popes talking to each other, and Benedict being like, "Why don't you think you should be pope?" And then it was preceded by like a half hour long flashback yeah. of it him. It was like inserting a separate movie. Yeah, and then this. and then it flashes back to them and Pope. Benedict being like, well, who, who cares about that? And then it was over. It's like, yeah, so I didn't need that to... half hour for you to be like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Exactly. Exactly. So. But it, yeah, it was, um, you gave your score already. I haven't yet. Um, I gave this one a 7.7. 7. 
I don't know, maybe I should give it a little higher, but um, because it was entertaining, honestly, I think it was like those flashbacks that just kind of made it, um, dropped it down a little bit. I mean, those for sure, those held it back from being in the high eights for me, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the one beneficial thing was like, I, I think, well. Maybe this isn't right. I was going to say, for someone who doesn't know a lot about Catholicism or didn't know a lot about kind of the transition, because Pope Benedict was the first pope to, like, step down from his position since, like, the 1400s or yeah, something like that. Yeah, I was surprised by really that. really long that time. Nuts. So, I mean, that sort of stuff was really fascinating to me. Um, so I was going to say, it's probably enjoyable for people, like, no matter what religion you practice or believe in or whatever. But I would say I've also heard people who um you know know these real life people much better is that i've heard that jonathan price's portrayal of pope francis is very very forgiving whereas pope bendix is like um like very very conservative like unflattering like even more unflattering than he is really anthony hopkins like that mm-hmm. okay because mm-hmm. i was gonna say one of the things is i thought he was criticized more for being kind of uh kind of a Nazi pope, right? Like, Mm -hmm. he was in Hitler Youth Camp Mm -hmm. as a kid. Yeah. And I felt like they brought it up kind of once and Mm -hmm. then didn't touch on it. And I'm like, ooh, I felt like you could have (laughs) dove into that and made him look not... Like, I thought they possibly made him look better than he was. I could be very wrong because while I am Catholic, I'm not, like, a very (laughs) well-practicing one. Yeah. So I don't keep up with some of this stuff. Uh, So I just assumed that. So I could be very wrong, like what you were just saying. But I thought they could have dove in dove into that and made mm-hmm. him look even worse than they possibly yeah. did in the movie. I mean, I I think the point is is that uh, like they're they're just very different people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that and is for the me, point. like that that message come ac- comes across, and that's fine. Like I understand not all of this was probably exactly the same, but it was it was fun to see Jorge, um, you know, kind of get Pope Benedict to lighten up a little bit. Like he's just like. Yeah, let's just grab a slice of pizza and a Fanta from like the vendor on the corner. And Benedict's like, "Oh my gosh! Like, are you sure we can do that?" And he's like, "Yeah, talk to people that live in your community. It's okay, <laughs> kind of thing." Mm-hmm. So I think really it was just to emphasize that they're just very different. So yeah, yeah. Some of it was kind of hokey, like the whole soccer thing, where like <laughs> yeah, like okay, one's from Argentina, right, and one's yep. from Germany, yep, and a, and then Pope. Francis or the future Pope Francis is like, oh yeah, both their soccer teams are really good. I bet you, well, we could possibly meet in the World Cup next. I'm like, okay, they do. Like, <laughs> yeah. like yeah, they meet in the World Cup final. Like, yeah. <laughs> I doubt that was actually said. That's just trying to make it. And then they have this scene at the end where they're watching the game together. I'm like, I don't know if that actually happened or not, but it's still kind of fun to, to see that. So, yeah. yeah. So, 7.7 for you. Yeah. 8.3 for me. Any closing thoughts or anything else on the two popes it was good i think it's on netflix it's easy to see so go watch it yeah um one thing i i there was one like quirky moment at the beginning that i wish they had a little bit more of because i loved it so much um it was like during the first conclave and jorge future pope francis he's in the bathroom he's kind of humming a tune and um you know ratzinger future pope benedict he's like oh what what is that song you're humming he's like oh it's dancing queen by abba like oh. do, do you not know that song you know so it's like it was just kind of a funny moment but then they show like all of the cardinals like filtering into the sistine chapel for the conclave and they're playing dancing queen in the background like wow that's like so quirky and ridiculous okay. and i wish they had some more just like total goofiness in it yeah i mean i mean I, it, it was lighthearted. the rest say, of the it way it kind of but... sets up the feeling of like how <clears throat> it's gonna this is gonna be a more entertaining <clears throat> movie and not as dry yeah. as you think it'll be yeah so i don't know i th- i thought that was kind of funny so that was the last thing that i wanted to bring up okay. uh so with that let's roll into this week's best picture winner which is from 1998 and the movie is rain man uh, so quick little synopsis. It's a story about it's kind of successful car dealer, car hustler, um, Charlie Babbitt, who's played by Tom Cruise. And uh, he finds out that his estranged father um, has passed away and willed his his fortune, his estate, basically, to a brother that he didn't even know he had, um, Raymond, who's played by Dustin Hoffman. And so it's kind of uh, the story of them getting to know each other growing as people. Um, the story is by 
Barry Morrow, and the screenplay was by Ronald Bass. Uh, Barry Levinson directed this one. Like I mentioned, Tom Cruise is Charlie Babbitt. Uh, Dustin Hoffman plays his brother Raymond. Uh, Raymond's on the autism spectrum, and he's been living um, kind of like in this care facility back in their hometown, which is Cincinnati, I think. Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the the basics behind the movie. Um, <clears throat> this movie had eight Oscar nominations with four wins. Um, obviously, it won Best Picture. Dustin Hoffman won for Best Actor. Barry Levinson won for directing, and then Barry Morrow and Ronald Bass won, excuse me, for writing. Um, it was also nominated for cinematography, set decoration, film editing, and then Hans Zimmer had the nomination for best original score. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. Did you just want me to dive into sure, like, what yeah, happens? Yeah. I didn't know where we we're going. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it opens with. Uh, Tom Cruise, Charlie Babbitt. Yeah, he runs, it's kind of a, not a super legit car, like yeah. dealership, not even dealership, but he sells kind of high-end cars, something. like Lamborghinis. Yeah. So <clears throat> he is apparently behind on orders, you know what I mean? Like he's, he, it's like a three-person office. It's him, his girlfriend, and this random other employee, and they're getting phone calls from people who are complaining that they haven't gotten their cars yet and basically he's coming up with excuses and lying to them to keep the sale so he doesn't lose the money he doesn't give off a very good first impression no i mean he's, sure. he's an asshole like he's a straight up dick asshole in the beginning of this movie and him and his girlfriend are supposed to go out on vacation he gets the call that his dad passed away so he brings her back to cincinnati for the funeral uh, and he wants to stay for the will reading because he's assuming or hoping that he would get, like, the estate from his dad. Get the uh, house, get a uh, car. an old car. That yeah, a car had. that he loved. And he makes a point that this is a car that Charlie loved as a kid but only drove once and it was without his dad's permission. And that was, him and his dad didn't don't have a good, or didn't have a good relationship. His dad even, like, called the cops on him for the missing car when charlie took that car and like out left him in left him in jail left for a him couple in jail. nights yeah so he's, he didn't have a good relationship with his dad so he's there for the will reading and gets the car like his dad leaves him the car that he always wanted but then leaves the estate to an unknown person mm -hmm. like they just straight up say this is going to someone that we're not allowed to tell you who it is and so Charlie, you know, investigates a little bit, finds out that whoever get, got left the estate and it, the estate's worth like millions of dollars, uh, left it to someone who is at a certain hospital. So he goes to that hospital. It turns out it's kind of a, I don't know what, what it, it's kind of a, it's for the. Well, it's, it's, it's a care facility. Yeah, so there you go. people on different, different levels of care. I mean, I don't know. Some, some places kind of describe it as like a mental hospital, but I mean, you just think of, like, Raymond, like I said, he's on the autism spectrum, so he needs help with certain, like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Care, daily care facility is good. Yeah. That, that's good. So he goes to the care facility and doesn't exactly know who he's looking for, and when he's in the office, like, in the building trying to figure out what's going on, in comes Dustin Hoffman as Raymond. He goes outside, just sits down in the car, and starts saying things to the girlfriend who's still in the car, like... Uh, you know, I used to I used to drive this car. I drove this car. It had it had a different paint job or different colored seats, but I definitely drove this car. And and Tom Cruise or Charlie comes back out and he goes, "Who is this guy? Get him out of here!" And uh, he hears them say the same things like, "Oh, this had leather seats at one point." And Charlie's like, "Well, this car did at one point." And he starts asking like, "Who is this guy?" And that's when he finds out Raymond is his brother. And that's who got that's who got the estate. Who and he doesn't even obviously because he's on the autism spectrum or scale and everything. He doesn't realize he just inherited millions of dollars. So Charlie decides to kind of kidnap him, and he's trying to get Raymond to sign over the estate or at least part of it because he feels that it's money that he deserved. So he kind of takes him you know they go on a walk outside and then he just basically kidnaps them and the point is he's trying to get back to uh where was he he was in la or yeah california california yep. 
he's trying to get back to his business and close on those car sales so his company doesn't go under. So he's bringing Raymond with him. And basically the reason he's kidnapping him, like I said, is to get the money, but to quote unquote negotiate with the doctor, Raymond's doctor or caregiver at the facility because because of Raymond's condition, that doctor is actually like the person who could sign over uh, the estate to mm-hmm. to Charlie. So he's kind of taking him as a negotiation, like I'll give you my brother back if you give me the money. Um, but when they're trying to get on the plane to get back to L.A., Raymond freaks out and he doesn't want to get on an airline that has had a plane crash before. So then Charlie's like, well, every plane airline has had an accident at one point. And that's when Raymond's like, Raymond's nope, like, Qantas. Nope, Qantas nope. has never had a crash. Qantas, which I think I saw trivia, Qantas has actually had a plane <laughs> crash before, but for the movie like, they just... No. just well, I was going to say, wasn't it something like they've had, like, a failed landing, but, like, no one, oh, maybe, no one died or maybe something that's like it. that? Maybe, maybe that's it. They've had a failed landing, but anyway. Well, that's that's a good trivia point, because I've been to trivia twice, and that's been, like, the answer to a question. Qantas. Like, what's the, what's the airline that's, you know, like, they talk about in Rain Man that's yep. never had a, a crash, so. So, Qantas, so they can't fly, because Qantas only flies out of Australia. <laughs> so, it turns into a road trip movie. They're driving from... Columbus to LA. Uh, the girlfriend, his Charlie's girlfriend, gets really pissed at him at one point, so she just straight up leaves. So it's just the two of them on this road trip. They have a couple stops along the way, but it's kind of a you know growing movie. Raymond's character doesn't really change throughout it. It's more so Charlie who grows. He turns from kind of a jerk you know, into a more loving and caring and understanding brother. Yeah. So by the end of the movie, when they're back in L.A. and they're talking through all the lawyers and everything about the estate, uh, Charlie is more so just saying, I want to be his guardian and I want to be his caregiver. Like, I don't really care about the money that much anymore. I just want to take care of my brother. Mm -hmm. And the doctors say that's I don't think that's the best idea. And Charlie at this point is kind of touching. He's he's like, I think I made an impression on Raymond. Because throughout the movie, it's implied, it's not implied, it's actually said, that Raymond can't really connect with people. He can't really show like too much emotion towards them or make too many decisions on his own. He kind of needs other people to make the decisions for him. And Charlie's like, no, 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 I connected with him. I think he... He wants to be with me. And so, you know, the doctor kind of goes like, through a couple questions with him that proves that Raymond really hasn't changed too much and can't really make any decisions on his own. So Charlie agrees that he should go back to Cincinnati and be with the doctor, but he's going to make an effort to see him and be with him more often. And there is one, like a, a touching scene that kind of shows that Raymond has gone through some change a little bit which i like you know you know he can't go through a lot but i like this little added thing and i read that it was actually improvised and because raymond doesn't like being touched or hugged or anything uh but at the end when they're just the two of them are alone charlie and raymond and they're talking and charlie saying like i i'm happy to be your little brother or i'm happy you're my big brother dustin hoffman improvised a scene where he like kind of leans in and puts his head on Charlie's head like kind of allowing them to touch and that's mm-hmm. like his scene of like I actually do love you and I'm okay with you touching me mm-hmm. that was apparently was improvised but I thought it was really good I like seeing a little bit it's realistic to it's I'm glad they didn't have him grow too much because that would be unrealistic right especially but to in show such a, a short amount of time yeah but to show a little bit of affection since this is a movie and you kind of want that nice touchy feely moment I appreciated that so uh, so yeah, that, I mean, it's basically moving in a nutshell. Some of those, there's a lot of funny parts throughout the road trip sequence. Like Raymond has to eat the same thing every Tuesday, every Wednesday. You know what I mean? Like fish like, sticks yeah, on Tuesday or whatever. Yeah. And Charlie goes and gets <laughs> them some fish sticks and Jello, and he only gets them four. And Raymond's like, no, eight fish sticks. So he like cuts them all in half. He goes, there you go, eight. <laughs> yep. Or um. Yeah. I always think of, like, he he can only wear, like, Kmart underwear. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're in the car, and Raymond's like, yeah, well, I'm not wearing any underwear. He's <laughs> like, what? I gave you some of mine this morning. He goes, well, they, they weren't from Kmart. I need Kmart underwear. And, yeah, that's a whole, like, a whole thing. <laughs> like, Tom Cruise has to pull the car over and just starts yelling, 
who the hell cares where you get your underwear from? It doesn't matter. Um, or the who's on first bit is a thing throughout this because Raymond is so, you know, analytical or, or whatever that uh, he like, has to solve that riddle, like who's on first. And the whole, and Charlie's like, it's a riddle. Like, there is no answer. Like, who, you know, that's always, that was a funny thing. And then the scene that had most people... Oh, a lot of people think of is since Raymond is so analytical, Charlie finds out that he can car- count cards. So then they go to Vegas, and you know, there's that that famous scene they're going down the escalator dressed alike. <laughs> yeah, and, that's right. Mm-hmm. And you know, they do the bet one one for bad, two for good, and they count cards. And it's been you know, I don't know, spoofed is the right term, but like in the Hangover when Zach yep. Alvin and Allen is doing counting cards, it's kind of spoofing that a little bit. So. Yeah, they count cards when they're in Vegas to to make some money so that uh, Charlie can save his business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a... I mean, I like this movie. This is a movie that, uh, growing up, I knew it would be great. Like, it's such a recognizable title yeah. and, and role with Dustin Hoffman winning the Oscar for mm-hmm. it. This is one of Tom Cruise's better performances for me, and it's really early in his career. But, I mean, he's really good in it. Um when I was a kid or however old I was when I was going into this movie to watch it, I knew it was going to be a classic, and I still really, really like it. Um, it's a movie that maybe a lot of people, I don't want to say made, they didn't make fun of it, but they did the Raymond voice, you know, like yeah. growing up. It's probably, some stuff is age you probably can't quite do <laughs> uh, th- this day and age as maybe you could back then, but it's still a really good movie, good message behind it and mm-hmm. good acting too. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So what score did you give it? I gave it, uh, coincidentally, this movie came out in 1988. I gave it an 8.8. 8.8. 8. There you go. Yep. So, uh, I do. I think this is a fairly rewatchable movie too. It uh, is. I'm watching yeah. it again with you, uh, you know, years after seeing it, I enjoyed it just as much as I did the first time, so. Yeah, and that was the second time I had seen the movie, and, um, yeah, it is. It's just, it's a really enjoyable movie. Like, I don't know why anyone would dislike this. I mean, I can understand if it's not, like, your all-time favorite movie, but I feel like it has such a wide appeal. Um, so, yeah, I give this one an 8.2. I think it's a really great movie. Um, it. it I don't think it's going to, like, blow you away, but it's just a really great story. Yeah, and we'll get into it when we look at the other nominees for 88, but looking at the other Best Picture nominees for the year, it wasn't, in my opinion, a particularly strong year either. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm not trying to downplay how no, good Rain yeah. Man is or anything, but... Sometimes you have different make, competition. Yeah, like, it makes sense that it won, but it isn't a movie that, that yeah, like you said, will blow you away. Like, a Sch- Schindler's List is, like, a movie that would win Best Picture no, almost no matter what, because it's just so strong and, every, like, and everything. And this movie is still great and well-deserving of the win, but it isn't on that same level, I guess I would say. Do we want to get into the other nominees that year? Yes, I will bring those up right here. Now, okay, so yeah, getting into the other big, you know, categories for the films of 1988, but the award ceremony was in 89. Uh, so you mentioned Rain Man won Best Original Screenplay. Uh, other nominees that year were Gary Ross and Ann Spielberg for Big. And now you might be asking, is Anne Spielberg related to Steven Spielberg? My first question, yep. <laughs> and, yeah, that is her brother. Okay. So they're bro- brother and sister. I actually remember, like, seeing them, being like, who is that? And amazed that she hasn't done more. Like, she's an Academy Award-nominated screenwriter, and her brother is one of the best, you know, directors of all time. Mm-hmm. But she really hasn't done a whole lot like other than this movie okay but anyway so yeah big big nominated best screenplay ron shelton for bull bull durham oh yes great movie that's a good movie john cleese for a fish called wanda Mm -hmm. which is uh, that's a pretty funny movie (laughs) we'll we'll talk more about it coming up though and then uh, naomi fawner for running on empty that one i have not seen or heard of so uh, so yeah, I'm not going to rework 
you know, or change too much here. If there's something that I would really note, I, I will. But those are the nominees and winner there. Rain Man, uh, probably deserving. The only other one I would maybe think of is A Fish Called Wanda. Is a pretty good screenplay. Uh, adapted screenplay. So the winner was... Uh, <laughs> Christopher Hampton for Dangerous Liaisons. Okay. Which I always think of Friends. Isn't there like a scene in Friends <laughs> where they're doing trivia and it's... What's what it, Rachel... Oh, no, no, no. That's not it. Yeah, it's is like, it, what does Rachel her say favorite her movie? favorite movie is? What's Rachel's favorite movie? Dangerous Liaisons. What's it, her actual favorite, favorite movie? movie? Weekend at Barney's. <laughs> Bernie's. Bernie's <Weekend> yeah. <laughs> so that one. Other nominees are Frank uh, Galata or Galaty for The Accidental Tourist. Anna Hamilton Phelan for Gorillas in the Mist. Oh, that's a good movie. Nice. Uh, Christine Edzard for A Little Dorrit, and Jean Claude Clary. A bunch of names that I can't pronounce here. <laughs> so I don't know any of these people. Have, are. I can't have simple names like John Smith or anything like that. Uh, the Unbearable Lightness of Being. That one I've not heard of. Most of these I have. The only. Two I haven't are the last ones in each category in the unbearable lightness of being and running on empty. Uh, I haven't seen Dangerous Liaison, so I guess I can't speak too much to that. But going into the Best Supporting Actress, so Joan Cusack was nominated for Working Girl. Uh, Frances McDormand, who we just saw when in we rewatched Almost, Almost yep. Famous, uh, was nominated for Mississippi Burning. Okay. Michelle Pfeiffer, nominated for Dangerous Liaisons. Sigourney Weaver, nominated for Working Girl. and Some then good names. Yeah, yeah. And then the winner was Gina Davis for The Accidental Tourist. And that was her only win. You know, she I think she was nominated for Thelma and Louise a couple years later. Uh, but that was her only win. Uh, moving to Best Supporting Actor, nominees, Alec Guinness, Little Dorrit. So this is later on in his life, yeah. 1988. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Landau for Tucker, The Man and His Dream. River Phoenix, Running oh, on Empty. Boy. Yeah. So there, that's, you know, River Phoenix, uh, I think. I don't know if that was posthumous or not, but obviously, you know, he passed away not that long after if he didn't already. I might have to see that movie. He's, that was his Oscar nominated movie. I'll have to look into that. Dean Stockwell was nominated for Married to the Mob. And then the winner, which is this is where I was going to talk about Fish Called Wanda a little bit more. Kevin Klein for Fish Called Wanda, which I love that he won this award because that's mm -hmm. a role in a movie that you wouldn't think as an Oscar winner or contender. It's a it's a comedy. It's mm -hmm. like a legit comedy. Yeah. And I love that that's Kevin Klein's Oscar win. He plays uh, kind of a dopey hitman. Uh, who, so I feel like I've only seen like the opening of this movie. I haven't yeah, watched the whole thing. So it takes place in England or in London, and he's an American hitman. And basically, they tease him the whole like the whole movie because he's kind of an idiot. <laughs> and I remember I was thinking of this scene at the end. He's trying to kill John Cleese, and John Cleese is making fun of him because he's like, "Oh, America isn't the greatest at winning wars." He goes, "Yes, we are." Kevin Klein's like, "Yeah, we're the ba we're the best. We're undefeated." He's like, Vietnam, and Kevin Klein just responds, Vietnam was a tie, and he like, starts <laughs> shooting at him, I was, for whatever reason, think of that scene, and he's hilarious in it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm glad he won, plays Otto West, that's his character name. Uh, best Actress nominees were Glenn Close for Dangerous Liaisons. Oh, she still hasn't won. No, she hasn't. A lot of people thought she would uh, a year ago, but still no win. Still no win. Melanie Griffith for Working Girl. Meryl Streep. Meryl. For A Cry in the Dark. Oh, we haven't watched that yet. I did. <gasps> the Dingo Ate My Baby. Yep, I ended up watching it without you. I'm sorry, but we were clearing out the DVR. Oh, so I'm devastated. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just ruined your day, didn't Did she do I? a good Australian accent in that? Yeah, she's pretty good. Okay, all right. But yeah, that movie that movie was all right. I mean, she was good in it. So mm -hmm. I think that was the only nomination that movie really got, which yeah. I understand why seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Sig Sigourney Weaver nominated for Gorillas in the Mist. So there she got nominated twice that year for a supporting yeah. and lead for Working Girl and Gorillas in the Mist. Uh, Gorillas in the Mist, great. I remember watching that in school, I think, where she mm. she goes up in the mountains and studies gorillas and befriends them and everything. Like it's that. pretty uh, impressive for Lakeville schools to be showing, like, a good movie. 
Well, what do you mean? They're always showing. Yeah, I know. Sometimes later on in like high school and stuff, it got a little interesting. But so yeah, it's the Lords and the Nemmies. The winner, uh, Jodie Foster for the Accused. This was her first win out of two. She would win a couple of years later for Silence of the Lambs. Uh, this one, this is a pretty heavy role. I don't know. Do you know much about no, the Accused? No, I don't. No. She plays... Uh, I don't believe so anyway. Sometimes you say these movies, I don't recognize okay. the title, but once you like tell me the plot, I'm like, oh, okay, I've heard of it. Okay, so she plays Sarah Tobias, and this is kind of a legal drama movie, but she plays a rape victim who gets gang raped, and it's a pretty graphic scene, especially for the time in 1988, and it's a... She goes, she tries suing him, right? She tries going to court, and it's this whole thing of like, you know, he said, she said, and mm -hmm. people don't believe her. They, and but she is telling the truth, but people don't believe her, goes to court. It's pretty heavy stuff, but she won the Oscar for that role. Uh, best actor, I mean, we already said the winner, Dustin Hoffman for Rain Man, but the other nominees were Gene Hackman for Mississippi Burning. Uh, which, I don't know if you've seen that one, that movie is kind of heavy as well. It's about, you know, KKK and uh, I think an FBI investigation and some murders uh, in the South, in Mississippi, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Tom Hanks was nominated for Big. That's his first nomination. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. <laughs> which is kind of similar to... Uh, Fish Called Wanda, only in the sense of it's kind of a comedy. Mm -hmm. And you don't normally think of, like, Oscar, which... I hate that my brain is wired to work that. Like, it shouldn't matter that it's a comedy or drama. Yeah. yeah. But that's just, unfortunately, how it works out, which I hate. But he's good in that movie. Got the Oscar nomination. Uh, Edward James Olmos, nominated for Stand and Deliver. Oh, no so good. Another movie. Yeah, I saw in high school, yeah. School all the time. <laughs> uh, I understand why. About a teacher, you know. Trying to like students, in, yeah. an inner city school, I think, where they, yeah, test scores are never that good. So, yeah, he gets them into shape. Lou Diamond Phillips is in that. Mm -hmm. And then um, Max von Slidow. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Max von Slidow, nominated for Pele the Conqueror. I know Max and, like, who he is. I don't know that movie at yeah, all. I've but, never heard of it. Uh, but, yeah, so that's Best Actor. <laughs> Best Director, now or winner was Barry Levinson, as we mentioned, for Rain Man. Nominees, uh, Charles Crichton for A Fish Called Wanda. So that's awesome. That got a Best Director nomination. Martin Scorsese, nominated for Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, that movie I haven't seen. I think that's the only nomination that that movie got. And it was, from what I've read, it's more of like a reward because that was a passion project for Marty for so long and it was a miracle he even got it made. So the Academy was kind of like, here's an Oscar nomination <laughs> for getting that passion project yeah. here is made. Uh, Alan Parker from Mississippi Burning. Mike Nichols uh, for Working Girl. So those are the nominees and winner there. And then the last one, Best Picture. We Obviously we talked about Rain Man today, so that was the winner. Other nominees were The Accidental Tourist. Dangerous Liaisons, Mississippi Burning, and Working Girl. So, uh, strong, strong category, you know, in some of these categories, really strong. A lot of well-named or known actors and actresses. Uh, I will say, out of the Best Picture nominees, I've only seen, like, two, two of them. Mississippi Burning, Rain Man, those are the only ones I've seen. So, yeah. That closes out the ninth, the sixty first Academy Awards for the nineteen eighty eight films. Beautiful, well done. Thank Love you. that. Thank you. I know. I'm uh, <laughs> the applause. Hold back. I know. <laughs> One thing that I thought of as you were talking about Kevin Klein for a fish called Wanda. So Kevin Klein voices um, like the landlord in Bob's Burgers, and his name is oh, Mister yeah. Mister Fish yeah. Odor. So I just think of that. Fish called Wanda. Yeah. Fish called go. Wanda. Mister yep. Fish Odor. Um, yeah, that show is so strange. It's so, so strange, but it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it made me think of that. Um, beautiful. That wraps up 1988. Let's get into 2019. Our movie close, rankings closing, for 2019. Yep, closing out 2019 movie year. Yeah, so I went ahead and ranked all of the movies that I've seen in 2019. All the new movies, like new releases that came out in 2019. Mm. I saw 27 new movies this year. Nice. I also did that. Let me see. I've got 
32. All right. So I saw a couple without you. Apologies, I guess. I probably didn't even miss them. That's probably why you went and saw them yourself and be like, yeah, I don't need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. So, yeah, let's. we're going to go from... Did you want to do like 10 through 6 right away? Or how did you want to do this? Uh, it doesn't matter to me. We can do that. Okay. I think you, that's what we've done before. You can go first. You're 10 through 6. Oops, I've, I'm, I'm making some changes right You're now. You're cha making changes on the spot? <laughs> I'm looking at it. I'm like, hey, you know, I don't know how I feel about this. So uh, maybe I'll just like call some of these honorable mentions because yeah, it's like... Yeah, we'll bring up, we'll bring I, up more. I feel than... like my top five are like super strong, hands down. Like I know these are my top five. And then from there, it's like the next like... 10, I, I could really put in anywhere, so I know oh, I feel. okay. So let me make sure I'm counting this right here. A, B, C, D. I was like, I have my letters because I have it in an outline format, so I got to make sure I know which letter lines up. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yes. 10 through 6. 10 through 6. Number 10. Always be my maybe. That was good. That's not in my top 10, but that, that was a funny movie. Netflix yes. movie. Netflix movie. Ali Wong, Randall Park. They were like best friends, neighbors when they grew up, um, and they kind of meet later in life and yeah. kind of fall in love again. Oh, yep. It's yep. cute. Good romantic comedy. Uh, number nine, Captain Marvel. Yeah, okay. Not in my top ten, but I mean, in enjoyable, good yep. good yep. MCU movie. Mm -hmm. Number eight, uh, Little Women. Uh, for not having seen any of the others, I didn't really have anything to compare it to, but I really liked this. All right. Really, really good. Um, number seven, I have Uncut Gems which we've talked about on the podcast. And number six, Ford versus Ferrari. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. For me, I, Ford versus Ferrari, I think it was, I mean, Uncut Gems is really good. Like I put them on like pretty similar level. I, honestly, I have Uncut Gems with a higher rating, but Ford versus Ferrari is just uh, a little more entertaining. Yeah. No, that totally, totally but the, fair. the more like lighthearted aspect to it, I think put that mm -hmm. one above it. So there's my 10 through six. So my number 10 is Spider-Man Far From Home. Okay. I love Spider-Man, so that skews it a little bit. He's my favorite yeah. superhero. I've been reading comics for almost my whole life. So I just love Mysterio, how they handled Mysterio in that movie. That for such a weird character and powers, uh, they incorporated him really well within the MCU. So I, and Jake Gyllenhaal, Holly is really good in that role too, so... That's my number 10. Number 9 might be a little bit surprised. I'm not sure. It's Klaus. I figured you'd have that in your top 10. You <laughs> just, really loved it. I just really liked that movie. Yeah. Anyone, if you're listening and you haven't seen Klaus, it's a Netflix movie. It was, it's nominated for Best Animated Film this yeah. year at the Oscars. Yeah. It won the BAFTA for Best Animated Film. Yeah. So it might, that's kind of an open category. Who knows what will win. But if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's good with kids. I mean, sure, there's some spooky elements to it, but it's good movie for kids. I know. I mean, it's kinda... not any worse than Mufasa dying. That's true. So. That's true. Um, I know we're kind of past the Christmas season, but I really like what they did with the lore of Santa Claus and how they incorporated a postman in it and everything. So yeah, Klaus, I gave that an eight point nine. Uh, that's number nine for me. I gave Spider Man an eight point eight, by the way. Okay. Um, number. Eight, Uncut Gems. Okay. Uh, number seven, Little Women. So we had those flipped, seven and eight. eight yep, and, seven. and then okay. I think our number six is the same, too. I got Ford versus Ferrari. Yes, yep, okay. So some similarities there. I mm -hmm. like that. Um, yeah, I had Spider-Man at number 12 on my list. Honestly, that's, like I said, the kind of like the er mid-teens, those are... They're all kind of in the same spot for me. So, um, my number five is The Farewell. Okay. Yeah, I know you love that movie. That I is did. not, that's my number 11. So, that just missed out for me. But I know you really like that movie. I did. It was just, it was so touching. The acting was so good. It was just, it was a nice original story, something I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. She it was, was so good. She was robbed. She should have gotten an Oscar I know. for it. I know. Oscar she really should have. Should've. Really good. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's my five. My number five is Avengers Endgame. Okay. That movie, I feel like that movie came out like two years ago. I know, it does <laughs> feel like a long time ago already. We've seen so many movies late in the year with like doing the podcast and everything. Yeah. I forget that this movie came out in what, April? 
Yeah, April or May. Which is where, like, Captain Marvel came out before that. March. So that feels like it was four years ago, even. But, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, the way they tied tied that whole, you know, 20-some movie uh, universe, how they close it out, they did it really well. Yep. Uh, my number four is Knives Out. Such a great uh, mystery, thriller, comedy. Like, it had everything going for it. Such a fun cast. Uh, just, like, one of the most enjoyable movies of the year. Yeah, Knives Out was great. Love the whodunit. The the way that they kind of... I, I don't want to say, like, they flipped a whodunit on its head, but they, there's a lot of twists and turns in that mm-hmm. that you didn't really see coming. So, yeah, that's great. Plus, Ryan Johnson's social media presence, like, since the movie came out, has been really funny. So, I like him a little more. So. Yeah. Um, my number four was The Irishman. Okay. I love Martin Scorsese. He's my favorite director of all time. Uh, the Irishman I, was great. I didn't mind that it was three and a half hours long. It's just mm-hmm. a really... Some movies are really, really good, and they're an hour 20. They're an hour and a half. They're two hours. Sometimes they're just three and a half hours long. Just deal with it. Huh. It's, it's on like Netflix. Titanic. Yeah, that's a movie that's three <laughs> hours long. Yeah, you're right. So deal with it. Um, I thought it was great. Unfortunately, I want Marty to win a second Academy Award, but that movie came out during, in my opinion, a really strong year where even though I loved it and I gave it a 9.3, it's number four on my yeah. my list of movies for the year. Kind of tough to say. It has not won anything in awards. Like the big no, awards. I do think it'll win screenplay. I think it'll pull out Adapted. You do. Yeah, I think it'll pull out. Though I think, hmm. I think Bong Joon-ho for Parasite has a chance to beat it out. Or no, 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 that's no, original. original. Jojo Rabbit. I mean Jojo Rabbit. I think Taika has a chance to beat it out. For adapted, but I think it still is a strong contender to win adapted screenplay. All right. Uh, my number three is Parasite. Such a good movie. Mm. So good. Seeing it, it, seeing it for the second time, like, really made me appreciate how incredible it was. So, uh, great movie. It's probably not one I could sit down and watch every day. So, yeah, that's why I got it at three. I think twice is you gotta good be picky. for a while. Gotta be picky. Yeah. So, that's so why I got it at three. Yep, fair enough. I've got Knives Out at number three. Mm -hmm. So we've already touched on that a little bit, but kind of an ensemble cast, a lot of great actors in it, uh, great performances. Uh, I like seeing Chris Evans in a non-MCU role because I know he's just a good actor. It's nice seeing him doing other things. And uh, yeah, the movie's just, it's really great. Mm -hmm. Uh, My number two, you've already said this, is Avengers Endgame. I... That movie blew me away. I loved every single second of it. I think it just came together so well. And if you, like, don't get excited at the end when all the portals start opening up and all the people start running in, ah, oh, it was just so good. Mm-hmm. So, so good. Like, I literally, Last 40 just, minutes, I, li- I literally just, like, got shivers right yeah. now just thinking about it. Last it 40 minutes just, of that movie is just nuts. Oh, so good. Only disappointment, Fat Thor. Did not like Fat Thor. The second... Show like viewing and so on. I've gotten over that a little bit. Appreciate it a little bit. Yeah, like the first time I really didn't like it, but the second viewing and so on and so forth, I've it's bugged me less and less. Just made me feel sad. Like he didn't care. Yeah, but uh, the viewpoint I've kind of taken on it is that's like his depression. Yeah. You know, like he that's him dealing with not being able to save everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've kind of gotten over it, especially since by the end he's kind of back, right? Like, he's yeah. still fat, but, like, he gets back into action and helps save mm-hmm. the day. So I've gotten but over it But he's the most attractive Avenger. So <laughs> to have him with a nasty beard and stuff. Ugh. Don't judge Turn someone on, uh, based on their looks. That's not <laughs> nice. That's kind of the point in the superhero movies, though. They're supposed to be good looking, right? Yeah, yeah true, true. <laughs> but anyway, Avengers Endgame was... So good. I loved it. Nice. So that's my number two. Nice, nice. I'm doing a hot switch, by the way, on this really quick. I'm making Irishman number three and Knives Out number four. Okay. I'm just previous ones. I'm looking at it, and I gave them the same score, 9.3s, but I'm like, no, I I like the Irishman a little bit more. So that's my actual number three and Knives Out number four. Mm. My number two, what? (laughs) Insane. Judging me on my change? Nope. I was just, I was looking like, oh, where did I put Irishman in my, like, list i have it third from the bottom oh fourth from the bottom 
Jeez. Yeah, there's not, just, that's not my kind of movie. I just, a good movie? <laughs> I don't was that like, too harsh? Yeah. Okay. It was I was joking, but it came off a little too much. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways, my number two, 1917. Uh, Fabulous movie. Yeah. It, surprisingly emotional i mean we did a whole review on it in our last episode so go back and listen to that but if you haven't already but that movie i mean it's a one shot so it doesn't have the grand scale of other movies where you can cut away and show larger scale things but it's just surprisingly emotional you get attached to these characters uh and yeah it's just phenomenal perfect segue into my number one my favorite movie of 2019 1917 um it was the only like new movie that i gave something higher than a nine it's one 9.8 it blew me away i had such high expectations and it still impressed me i just i loved almost every second of the movie so that was my favorite movie of the year be your favorite movie for a while 9.8 yeah exactly (laughs) what's gonna top it and it's probably it's probably the leading contender to win Best picture, best yeah. director. It's winning yeah. most of the, you know, other guild or association awards for it. There's still a little bit of hope or steam behind my number one, which is Parasite. I gave it a, up to, to a 9.7 after the second viewing. Mm-hmm. I gave 1917 9.5. Um, I just think what Bong Joon-ho did with this movie, where we're, we're living in an age where people are like, no one can make original movies anymore, or creative original movies, and yeah. while 1917 is original, I mean, it's about World War One. I. I mean, the story isn't anything crazy, that movie is great in how it was shot, and the way it looks for the most part. Mm-hmm. Parasite, I mean, is so original in... The story and the twist and turns it that it takes and the the metaphors or the the symbolism behind it. It's so creative. It's so amazing. Uh, I do. I just, I love that movie. You kind of got to take a deep breath after seeing it (laughs) to an extent, but uh, I do. I I just, I love that movie so much. I hope the way it works out because I do like 1917 and Parasite. They're my one and two on the year. Mm -hmm. I hope there's some kind of split with best picture and director. Uh, for, for those two, I'm kind of leaning towards like maybe Sam Mendes gets best director and then Parasite wins best picture. Uh, I'd kind of be happy with that as long as Bong Joon-ho, as long as Bong Joon wins screenplay because I want him to actually win an Oscar. Mm -hmm. Like it'll win best foreign film and he'll accept that award, but it doesn't necessarily count towards his like Oscar win count. Uh, so I want him to win an Oscar, so I hope he gets it for for screenplay, but then they split Best Director and Picture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, what honorable mentions did you have, if any, that you wanted to bring up? Um, so uh, some other, mo- yeah, honorable mentions. Um, I know you already mentioned Spider-Man, Far From Home, that was really good. Klaus was good as well. Uh, Jojo Rabbit was, that, I mean, it's it's been such a strong year. Um, it's true. That that's maybe my, that could have made it in the top 10, but it was just tough. That's my number 14, and it's an 8.6. I mean, my, you know, almost all these are in a 9 for me. Klaus is an 8.9, and then Spider Man 8.8. So, yeah, a lot of strong movies. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood wasn't in my top 10. That was yeah. a pretty strong movie. Mm-hmm. At least it's getting a lot of award notice. My lowest. Rated movie was 21 Bridges. At yeah, a six, that was, that 6. was 7. second to the bottom for me. Um, just out of the top 10 at number 11, I had Booksmart. Um, yeah. I wish that movie had gotten a little more... Yeah, did that? Just, like, interest. I feel like it kind of came and went. Did that get nominated for screenplay? It should have if it didn't. I don't believe so. Yeah, you I should, felt like... You I, should look it up, though. I felt like that was a, a snub that happened, mm-hmm. though. But, uh, um, yeah. Right in the middle for me, This I don't think we've mentioned this movie at all, but uh, we watched El Camino, the Breaking Bad movie. Oh, uh, yeah, we haven't really brought that up. Um, it's It was one of those, like, it was everything I needed it to be in terms of a Breaking Bad, like, Jesse story arc. Yeah, it's, it's a really long episode yeah. of the show. Yeah. Like, it wasn't so necessarily just, a movie, it was 
was just... And, yeah, it was perfect in the sense that it felt exactly like the TV show, and it gave you a little bit more information, and it was, yeah, it was really good. So, just wanted to give a little shout-out oh, yeah. for that. Yeah, that's kind of, it's like an 8.4-ish for me. But, yeah, some, I mean, Booksmart did not get an Oscar nomination, by the yeah, way. I it sh- think so. It should have. That one, I wish that would have gotten some love. But, yeah, I mean, I've got Shazam, which I saw this year, that was surprisingly good. Um, we both kind of joker a little bit lower on our list, and I think maybe <laughs> other people last, have. Last. I have it last on my list. It's not quite last for me. It's a 7.7 for me. So it isn't even, like, a bad movie for me. It's just not as great as other people have it. I have Pokemon Detective Pikachu is a 7.2 on my list. That's one I saw with LU. Uh, we went and saw Harriet at the... Like cheapo theater, discount theater, yeah. Yep, recently, that was a seven point one for me. Uh, I thought because she got Cynthia Cynthia Revo. Revo, Revo, she got an Oscar nomination for that role, which she's good in it. I would still argue that maybe Aquafina was better. I yes, I would tend to lean that way too. Um, it's yeah, I, I liked that movie, but it wasn't, I, I didn't love it, and I don't know why. I didn't love it. Okay, it's a good movie. It's a movie about Harry Tubman, which is great. It's a story that needs to be told. Awesome. But that movie, to me, was a very bland, paint-by-number biopic. It was no, very bland. Nothing just... surprising happened in that movie. She was good in it, but I honestly watched that. If you wouldn't have told me she was nominated for an Oscar for it, I wouldn't have believed that she mm-hmm. got an Oscar nomination mm-hmm. for it. Um, they incorporated her like visions kind of weird in that movie, too. I'm not saying they shouldn't have had them in there, but the way that they incorporated them were kind of weird to me. And yeah, it was just bland. It was kind of dull to me. It, it made it kind of sad, like... Someone like Harriet Tubman, this was the first, like, feature-length film that's ever been made about her. It's like, come on, like, do something with it. I felt like it yeah. could have been so much better. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, Cynthia Revo plays um, a detective in that HBO show that we've been watching, The Outsider, and she's so good in that. Like, mm-hmm. She's really good at yeah. that. Yeah. Like, that's that's better than her <laughs> her portrayal in Harriet. Yeah. So. No, I do. I wish I wish Aquafina would have gotten a nomination yeah. over her. And, like, to be... To be fair, like, if that would have happened, guess what? Cynthia Riva could still be going for the EGOT because she has a nomination for the song that's in that Mm -hmm. movie, so. One thing that was cool, just, and I'm, sorry, I'm giving some more Harriet stuff because we didn't talk about Harriet and we saw it, um, is that, because, yeah, like, we sat through the credits because that's when, like, the original song plays. It's like, I wanted to hear it because I knew it was nominated, and the credits are rolling by and they've got, you know, like, old-timey kind of scripts, like, handwriting, kind of the 1800s. I saw his name, I'm like... Whoa, 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 did that say Namdi Asamoah? And you're mm-hmm. like, yeah, he's gotten into, like, filmmaking and movie producing. So, yeah, he, used, he was a defensive player in the NFL for a number of years. Like, mm-hmm. very good athlete. And um, so it was really cool to see his name tied to, um, tied to a, like, a movie. So, yeah, yep. It's very cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, last thing I, I mean, I got a whole list of movies here, but the last one I was going to bring up was we went, we saw Us with, that felt like a million years ago. <laughs> yep. uh, and I gave that an eight, kind of in the middle of the pack here. I thought it was good, not as good as Get Out, but still still pretty good. And that was kind of another role with Lupita people looked at and saw. Well, maybe she should have gotten a nomination. Yeah, I, I don't know how she hasn't gotten more love for that role. Mm-hmm. So it just, it came, is it maybe because it came out so early Probably. in the year and people have kind of forgotten about it. That mm-hmm. could be something to do with it. So maybe Jordan Peele will start releasing his movies later in the year. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, but yeah, that's, that's you know, a couple, more than a couple honorable mentions there. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of fun bringing up some of the, it's like a time caps of all the movies we've watched this year. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so okay, it, are we finally closing the chapter yes. on 2019? Yep, we're closing it out on 2019. I guess throughout the episode we talked about the Oscars that'll be coming up this weekend a little bit. So next week uh, we'll probably do somewhat of a review of what happened uh, Oscar Sunday. We don't really know if we have a current or non-best picture winning review uh, lined up yet. There's a couple things we could do. Maybe we'll just do the Oscars. Uh, I've got a list of movies that some co-workers of mine said were their favorite movies of all time. So maybe we'll work through those or some of your co-workers and review them. Uh, or maybe we'll just randomly pick a movie and we'll go back and forth and pick one. And, you know, we just watched Almost Famous, so maybe we'll review that sometime soon. But 
Along with whatever we decide there, we've got Gladiator, which won Best Picture in 2000, uh, directed by Ridley Scott. Russell Crowe won Best Actor for it. That's kind of a big blockbuster hit. I think a lot of people are very familiar with that movie, have a lot of opinions on it, so we'll review that one in our next episode, which we might switch to an every other week uh, cadence. We've been doing every week here because we've been seeing so many movies uh, in theaters with Oscar season and everything, but now that things are going to slow down a little bit, I think we might switch to an every other week cadence here, but we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. I'm excited, though. It should be fun. Looking forward to the award ceremony. I always love seeing what people wear. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for the Oscars. It'll be cool. I know a lot of people pan it, and uh, they think the show is kind of boring and whatever, but I always love it. So yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. A lot of the big awards have kind of been decided already to an extent. Like, all the acting categories are Those pretty, are pretty much, much determined. Up. Um, the closest race is really like Parasite or 1917, and 1917 appears to be the favorite, but we'll see if anything surprising happens. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's the show today. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please rate and review us on, uh, on Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple, give us the old five-star rating. Give us a quick review. Help build up the popularity here for the show Follow us on social media. We are at Oscar Real Pod on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I try to post as much as possible on there if new trailers or things like that are coming out. And, you know, I'll post our graphics for our scores and everything, too, in case you, you, you forgot and you want to brush up on that. So, you know, click that follow button. But, yeah, other than that, that's been our show. So, from Matt and Haley, this has been the Oscar Real Movie Podcast. Go see a movie this week.